what, what's, what angle's not being covered on climate that you feel, just personally? Um, oh, gosh. The first one can we start? Is there something that we're missing? Because there's a lot of climate news out yeah, there, right? Uh, so what are we not doing? I got that one. Is, okay. uh, yeah, it, uh, drought, because uh, it's really hard to cover because it's super slow moving. And um, like dirt looks like, what do, you sh what do you shoot? What do you photograph? <laughs> <laughs> so um, it, it has this tremendous impact. It's really important. Mm -hmm. um, but it is very difficult to talk about. Um, uh, we have Lisa Song on the end. Um, she is an alumna of uh, MIT's science writing program um, and an investigative reporter at ProPublica who covers environment, energy, and climate change. Lisa joined ProPublica in 2017 after six years at Inside Climate News, where she covered climate science and environmental health. She was part of the reporting team that revealed Exxon's shift from conducting global warming research to supporting climate denial, a series that was a finalist for the 2016 Pulitzer Prize for Public Service. Even though she did not win that, do not feel bad for her because in 2013 and 2014, she reported extensively on air pollution from Texas's oil and gas boom as part of collaboration between several newsrooms. And she is the co-author of the Dilbit disaster, which did win a Pulitzer Prize for national reporting. Um, congratulations. Uh, she beat out another uh, MIT science writing alum that year. Um, Wait, who? Uh, um, Kendra Pierre-Lewis uh, is a another alum of the MIT graduate program in science writing. Um, she's the author of the book Greenwashed, Why We Can't Buy Our Way to a Green Planet, uh, and covers climate for the New York Times. Um, previously, she's been a staff writer for Popular Science, where she wrote about science, the environment, and her hatred of mayonnaise. Her writing has also appeared in 538, The Washington Post, Newsweek, Modern Farmer, and Slate. Um, and then next to me is Beth Daly, who I just found out is also a neighbor of mine. Um, that's the most pertinent thing. Uh, <laughs> she is editor and general manager of The Conversation um, and has covered the environment, science, and education for almost two decades at the Boston Globe. Um, she's also been an investigative reporter at the New England Center for Investigative Reporting and head of strategic development for Inside Climate News before joining the conversation. She was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize uh, and has won awards from the Association of Healthcare Journalists and the Society of American Business Editors and Writers. So without further ado, uh, I'll let them take it away. So I just thought it would be really helpful, uh, maybe start with you, Lisa, just to, just to talk a little bit about your job and your beat uh, and, and, um, and some things you've covered and then we'll Sure. Go to Kendra, and then we'll launch in with questions, which I have a long list, and okay. have a conversation. Um, yeah, so I work in the ProPublica office in New York, which is our main headquarters. And um, my job, basically, is to write about climate change and or environment. And I have basically complete freedom to pursue whatever stories I want, um, which is an inc incredible luxury and amazing, and very few newsrooms where reporters can do that. Um, and our specialty is investigative reporting. So we are often take weeks or months or sometimes more than a year to report and research and write a single story or a single series. Um, so we're able to dig really deeply. Um, I, I think the, the sort of driving principle behind all of our stories is we want stories that can create impact. So trying to reveal wrongdoings, corruption, things that are not great, and then hopefully, you know, if all goes well, perhaps somebody with power can change a law or um, change a regulation or create a new regulation or do something to fix the problem we're revealing. Um, so our newsroom covers kind of every beat under the sun. So we have um, political reporters and people who cover immigration, healthcare, um, the economy, you know, education, and then um, there's a few uh, climate and environment reporters. Um, so that's kind of how we're structured. Oh, um, so <clears throat> I'm a reporter on the Climate Desk. Um, so uh, the Times has a dedicated desk for climate reporting. Uh, we're about two thirds of us are in New York, about a third of us are in DC. The DC people do more political and policy stuff. Um, in New York, we do, um, or I do mostly science, um, but I'm not on the science desk. We have a science desk, but that is, they're not even on the same floor as us. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a mixture of um, like daily reporting stories, so if a study is coming out, and then um, 
so a mixture of those kinds of stories as well as doing uh, longer reform stuff that can take you know weeks or months to report out while I'm doing sort of daily stories. Um, yeah, and so it really depends. Um, and then there's like stuff like um, I call it the natural like hazard beat. So um, hurricanes, wildfires, things that have a climate link. Um, I really like winter, <laughs> uh, at least in the north or in the northern hemisphere, because there are fewer of those um, stories that sneak up on you. Um, yeah, so yeah. that's great. The um, I, you know I, I have a million questions about everything about your audience and how we talk about climate change as journalists. Um, but I think it would be really good to talk about some of your stories first. And, and Lisa, I'll start with you because you've done amazing work on carbon offsets. Um, and it, it was, I don't know how many people have read it here, but it was an amazing, a lot of people have read it, amazing piece of journalism that, that really examined from several vantage points. And I'll you sort of tell a story how you got into it. Of um, you know something that I think intuitively people in some environmental spaces know was probably not working was this idea you could offset carbon emissions with um, trees and whatnot. And but Lisa actually set out to to, to prove it um, quantitatively um, in many ways by looking at more than two decades of going back two decades. Yeah, so <laughs> it's um, so yeah. So I'd love to. Hear, I think people would love to hear how you got into that story and the challenges of it and sure how it came out and oh gosh, how did I get into it? Um, so the end of every count, we tend to do projects on a calendar year schedule. So the end of 2018, I was free from my previous stories and kind of searching for a new story for the 2019 year. Um, and that was when the um, UN uh, climate negotiations were happening in Poland. And I started reading stories about um, you know, arguments with the negotiations related to this old UN uh, offsets program. And this was this program that had been created decades ago, um, and the idea was uh, you know, a company in a developed country could pay someone in the developing world, you know, often India, China, Brazil, to build a hydro dam or build a solar power plant or something, something clean, and if they could claim that this new project was built in place of a coal power plant or something that emitted more carbon, then they would take the difference of the carbon emissions and then say, because you've built this cleaner thing, the polluter in North America or Europe could then emit that many tons of CO2, and they would be canceled out by this project elsewhere. And what was becoming clear you know, more than a decade after the projects launched was tons of fraud, tons of problems with um, verifying that the emissions reductions were real. There had been this report that came out saying something like 85% of the emissions reductions were very suspicious. And so this had been the biggest experiment with carbon offsets ever that the world had done, and it was basically a complete failure. So that was kind of the context of, of these. And even that program had decided there was one type of offset, which is somebody owns part of a forest somewhere, and they were going to cut it down. But instead, you, they're not going to cut it down, because you were going to pay them for the carbon offsets of what those trees are worth. And they're going to use that money to make a living in some other way that doesn't involve logging and cutting down the trees. So this type of, it's called like a forest preservation offset. And even that old UN program had said, these types of offsets are really difficult to quantify and verify. And so we're not going to allow you to use these. But there had been, you know, in the past 10 years, this renewed push to try and start these programs for real on a large scale. And the state of California was debating whether to vote on this measure that would encourage these types of offsets. So, I had seen a lot of um, arguments among activists and environmentalists, and there was a lot of vaguely worded language, like, oh, we know this doesn't work. You know, we have examples of sort of trial runs where we know this doesn't work, but nobody was saying anything specific. So I started trying to report it um, you know, as much as I could, reading old reports, talking to the few scientists who've actually tried to study this in a quantitative way. Um, and it became obvious that California was basing a lot of its decision on what was happening in this remote area of Brazil, um, the state called Acre, where they supposedly had the world's best program that was almost ready to do these kinds of offsets. So um, 
you know, and, and I, it became clear I had to go to Brazil, but um, I'd never done international reporting. I didn't speak any Portuguese, um, but my newsroom completely supported me. They, you know, gave me the resources to, um, we hired a, um, a freelance reporter from Brazil who was working in the US and she became my co-reporter. We went to Brazil together for two weeks, talked to a ton of people, and we interviewed government officials who blatantly said, you know, we need the money from these offsets for forest preservation to keep the trees standing. We care more about the conservation money than about the quantitative truth of the offsets generated. You know, and, and they were very blunt about that. And, you know, when you talk to them and you see how bad deforestation is, it's completely understandable. They, they want, they have so little money to, you know, track illegal loggers and miners. They need anything they can get to keep the tree standing. And so they're sort of making a bet that it's more important to keep some trees standing than to maybe have some suspicious carbon offsets. And that kind of became a big part of the story is some of the people involved kind of know there's a lot of uncertainty. And, and they're willing to acknowledge that, but it becomes for them a value judgment about is it more important to keep the Amazon standing and healthy um, than it is to maybe emit more CO2 than we are admitting on paper. Um, and so, but there was a whole lot of problems with these types of projects. And we found one project in Cambodia that had actually passed sort of the most rigorous standards out there, which are run by a variety of nonprofits. And we partnered with a satellite nonprofit firm that actually found through satellite analysis more than half the trees in the project had already been cut down 10 years after the project began. Um, yet it was still on the market and selling offsets. And the way, you know, the way that these programs are run, they rely on people to go into the field every few years and file a report, but they, those people hadn't filed a report in five years, and they wouldn't actually cancel the project for another 10 years at least beyond that. So we were able to tell them before their actual employees that, you know, we might want to take a look. Something is very wrong on the ground. Right. <laughs> did, and, and what did, I'm curious if California was there, did they, after the story came out, did, was You know, they eventually voted to approve the thing right. to encourage these offsets, you know, but it passed by one vote. So I don't know, maybe it would have <laughs> passed by more votes without the story. Um, but I do know a lot of people you know, in the, the state government did read the story. It was discussed during the final debates before the vote. Um, you know, there's, in general, one thing I found is there's not a lot of researchers or reporters looking intensely at carbon offsets. Um, you know, they always come from a place of good intentions, and I think there can be some reluctance to, to probe that. Right. Um, and there's a lot of environmental groups who, who truly support carbon offsets and you know, um, have invested a lot of time and energy into them. That's great. I, I want to come back to sort of like, as you write these uh, climate stories, how much you think about what's happening after the fact and impact. But well, I'd love to talk to Kendra about, you do many, many sto stories, um, but I, I, I really liked your wildfire story um, that you'd written um, sort of that were taking place all around the world mm -hmm. as a wildfires. And I think, can you talk a little bit about how you conceived that story and the mm -hmm. challenges to it? And Yeah, it. Um, so that one was one that was assigned. They were sort of like, um, the Amazon was burning, and um, I think, I don't think California was on fire yet, but people were sort of, it was still kind of recovering from last year. And they were kind of like, you know, there's, and, and there, it, I think, the footage of like there were fil uh, not film but like satellite images of like um, parts of sub-Saharan Africa that were on fire, and there was a lot of tweets about it, and people seemed very concerned about the Amazon, and they were kind of like, um, "Can we do a piece about how the whole like the world is on fire?" And I was like, "Well, we can't because actually worldwide wildfires are declining um, because of um, agriculture, actually. So lots of places that should be burning naturally are not burning because we've chopped everything down and planted crops. So yay, I guess." Um, <laughs> um, but I said, what we can say is these four things. We can say, um, uh, and I'll tell you the one that we ended up dropping. Um, we can say that the Amazon is on fire because it was deliberately set, and um, the link to climate change is not, um, climate change didn't start those fires, but that obviously by burning the way the Amazon is burning, it is contributing to climate change, and that's not great. 
Um, we can talk about fires like the ones that are happening out west, which are part of the natural ecosystem, um, but climate change is exacerbating this wildfire cycle um, in conjunction with some other factors. Um, and we can talk about prescribed burns, which are, are, are cool burn, or um, uh, like less intensive burns, which are deliberately set um, because lots of ecosystems, especially across North America, were um, like, I don't want to say evolved with fire, but that's kind of the best way of saying it. And so the United States government, um, pretty much for over 100 years, engaged in this policy of fire suppression that in, is also making wildfires worse. Um, and then, oh, I can't remember what the fourth one was. Um, that might have, oh no, the fourth one was prescribed burn, and that one got dropped because it didn't quite fit into the narrative that we were looking for. And the third one um, was, uh, I'm blanking, I'm sorry. <laughs> but basically it was sort of like sketching out. Do you remember? <laughs> I'm just thinking now because I just reread it today again. Um, burned. No, I'm blanking now. Um, but it was sort of like this three bullet point um, narrative, and that was just to help people kind of understand right. fire. Um, I've low-key been obsessed with wildfires for a couple of years, which is, I think, why they were like, can you write this as opposed to another science reporter? Um, and one of the things is that I have tremendous respect for wildfire, but also I think one of the things that's really harmful with the narrative and the way we talk about wildfire is many people think that all fires are bad. And so the, the, whole, the point of that narrative was not to say that it was great that the Amazon was on fire. It was not great. Um, but to say that, like, this is why it's not great, and to really kind of under, have that understanding that like fire is highly context dependent, whether or not it is a good fire or a bad fire, um, and yeah, and so that was fun. I guess it was really interesting. Um, I ran into a fire researcher that I sometimes use but didn't use for this story um, shortly after, and he was like, it was one of the best stories on wildfire he'd read about the whole situation, and I was really grateful because that was the other thing was it was true that sub-Saharan Africa was very much on fire. But the, at the time, the area that was on fire, there's concern now about the Congo, like the rainforest in the Congo, and that's a different category. But it was the savanna that was on fire, and that tends to burn kind of dramatically every year because um, there's like human start fires, but also lightning can start fires, and these tend to get started by lightning. And so that was, it was also it was a combination of those kinds of fires and ag fires. And so helping people kind of understand that nuance is really important because as we move into a warming world, there are going to be more of these kinds of discussions happening. Right. It, it, both those stories struck me as incredibly <clears throat> well, well reported, of course, but also both of them were so well explained. It felt to, it was very clear. Like you walked away saying, oh, I get it. And I, 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 I wonder when you pursue these stories, how much are you thinking about your audience and who is your audience? And you can speak both from, from your organizational standpoint, but also personally, because sometimes those can be very different, you know? So, do you want to um, I think it's a little bit different for me than because um, I'm just doing so many more <coughs> stories than Lisa's doing. And so in general, I assume most people don't want to read a climate change story, um, even if they accept the science <laughs> and are relatively engaged. When you click on a link about climate change, you're generally not expecting happy news. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of go into every story with kind of that in mind and also the idea that people are smart but um, uninformed. Um, which I think is useful. So I try and like describe all the terms. I try and kind of really explain it to people in ways that are easy for them to wrap their heads around. Um, because I live in, you know, like that that story about that you liked. Um, that came. That was a day and a half's worth of work, basically. Um, they I walked in on Monday um, and they wanted it, and I and um, <laughs> that would have taken me like. Much longer. <laughs> but the, the background of that is I had been obsessed with wildfires for two years. So that was just like me being like, well, I know all of this stuff. And like, I know all the people, like, all of the people to call. And like, um, so like behind that like day and a half of work was like two years of like reading and studying and like being obsessed with wildfires and going out on a prescribed burn. And But like, so who's, when, when you, someone's reading that story, who, like who's on the other side? Like who, who, who are you imagining or, or who do you hope is reading it and? Um, you know, someone who lives in California, someone who's freaking out about the Amazon, um, somebody who is thinking about parking a hot car on grass during a drought. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but basically, like any, you know, I'm very fortunate to work. Um, we have an amazing art director on our team, and so I'm very lucky to have a lot of evocative imagery and those and graphics and those sorts of things to kind of um, entice people in um, when the study is kind of heavy. Um, but yeah, generally, I'm you know I don't have like this specific person in mind beyond maybe like 
slightly curious, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I want to sort of talk a little bit more about but Lisa, I, I want you to explain yeah. who your audience is, because I, I think it is different. Yeah, I think it's slightly different. You know, we are writing for a general audience. We assume that our audience knows what climate change is and maybe is at least slightly worried about it. But beyond that, we don't expect them to know any of the jargon or terminology. So we are writing not for climate wonks. Or, you know, we want them to read it as well, but they're going to read it anyway, because it's probably part of their job. Um, but we really want the general audience who, um, and, uh, you know, and like Kendra said, it's really hard to get people to read climate stories for fun, because often they're not fun. Um, it's sort of doom and gloom beat is what we call it. And for this one, I think because it was so counterintuitive, the idea that you know everyone has a warm and fuzzy feeling when you talk about saving trees and particularly saving the Amazon and you know you want to pay money to rural communities so they can find a more sustainable livelihood and then in return they save those trees and you cancel out your carbon emissions from when you're driving or from this particular company. That sounds great. Um, poking holes in that can sometimes feel not great, but I think there was enough curiosity about what it actually means to look deeply into it that we hoped people would respond. Um, and we did get a lot of readers. Um, the other, uh, obviously, people we want to read are, are people, because we were writing about something as California was about to make this important decision, we obviously wanted all of the board members and the regulators and anyone involved in that decision to read it so they could be better informed. Um, we wanted residents in California who cared about the Amazon and cared about this decision to read it. Um, and so, you know, when at, I, I, I know because I was told by residents in California that it was read by um, a lot of people within the state and people involved in this decision. So that that's always a, a good thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I often wonder when you're when you're when you're. And I guess I did it too when I was writing a story. Are you, and it's about the the also it's about the the language that we use. If you, if you and I'd love you to address that because. Maybe a, f a few was it a few months back in September, the Guardian and several others had decided to call. I think one, the Guardian started the climate emergency. They were going to call climate change stories a climate emergency, and there were several other efforts to sort of um, get journalists together and journalism organizations together to write about climate in, this, in, in a certain way using certain language with a sense of urgency, and it was quite controversial uh, among among journalism organizations and journalists individually. I just love for you guys to talk about that, like. How much does choosing the right language, um, or I guess what language do you use, in, 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 and what, what's allowed in your organization? Um, and if you think that's um, helping, well, this is going to be a long question, but, but I really, what I really want to get at is this idea of middle ground, right? Like this, this idea of if, 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 if a journalist role, and I'm not saying everyone accepts that, is to help inform sort of the general population on both sides. Are you choosing language to try to get at that? Or are you saying, no, it's, it's an urgent issue, and we're going to only write about it like that to the exclusion of some people? I don't know if that was that clear. but Yeah, I, I don't think that we have institutional rules on this. Mm -hmm. um, it really comes down to the story. I, I tend to just use the term climate change because it's accurate, and everyone knows what it is, um, and you're not distracting them. Um, sometimes I'll also use global warming to re avoid repetition, perhaps, in a paragraph. Um, I think I used the word climate crisis in a recent story I wrote about cap and trade in California, but I believe it was in the context of explaining that um, we're now in an era where even in the past year or two, the public understanding and feeling of urgency over the climate crisis has expanded tremendously. Right. And so I thought, I think it was either a sentence like that or something about, you know, we are now at a point where people realize how quickly and how drastically we need to act. Mm -hmm. And so it was in that context that I think I used the term crisis. But I don't think I even talked about it actively with my editor. It just made sense given what I was writing about. And it felt like the right word. Um, but I don't think we have blanket rules on what terms to use when. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I work in a very large institution. <laughs> we have the style guide. Um, it is long um, and very detailed. Um, <laughs> and sometimes there are, there are funny words. I can't think of one right now, but I had written something, and my editor changed it. And I was like, why? And he like pointed to the style guide, and it doesn't like that structure of 
phrase or something. And I was like, OK. <laughs> it was like wonky enough. Um, and our CMS tells you that it doesn't like certain words, um, which is fun. So we don't use climate crisis. Um, and I don't have, like, that's just our role, and that's it. Um, I think in terms of conveying, so I did a story recently um, that a lot of people did about um, like how climate change is going to make future generations sick. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a really sad and kind of troubling scenario, like what happens to kids who live in a four degrees Celsius world, because that's kind of the trajectory we're on. Um, and so I had these experts say various things about what that actually means, but um, uh, a friend of mine read it, and she said it made her cry. And then another friend read it, and it made her cry. It's pretty, pretty much of a downer. I <laughs> and, um, and I was like, but it, it was surprising to me because um, it was a study story. It was based on a Lancet report that had come out. So I knew I wasn't the only person who had covered it. And so I read, um, after the fact, other people's reporting. And, and I noticed that what I'd done differently, and it wasn't deliberate, I don't think, um, was that I didn't actually talk that much about um, I talked about the impacts, but I didn't talk about the impacts in a um, very scientific way. So like, um, one of the effects of a warming world is there's going to be more um, small particulate pollution in the air. And it's there partly because we're burning fossil fuels, and that creates it, and partly because as it gets hotter, forests burn, and that creates it. So it's like this double whammy. And I talked to this researcher, and, she, and, and I was like, you know, why is it that kids are more susceptible than we are? And she was like, their hearts beat faster. Um, and, they're long, and uh, they're lo they breathe more quickly. And I don't remember that's like, I'm ruining it. The quote was much better. But the, the turn of phrase, anyone who's ever held a child, you can almost immediately kind of feel it, which is why I felt it was important, which is why I put it in the piece. Um, and I think that those sorts of choices are what people felt. Like, um, there's a guy, uh, a developer, who sits not next to me, but we hang out in one of the open spaces a lot. And he's a developer, so he's not a reporter. Um, and he turned to me and he's like, I, I read your article. And he's like, well, I skimmed it. <laughs> and it's like, fair. <laughs> uh, and he was like, uh, I just had a kid. It kind of bummed me out. And like, I was like, both like, oh, I'm sorry. But also that was like, good. Like, <laughs> like you, you, you are the person who should be bummed oh, yeah. out because you had a kid. So like, and you are, you, your kid can't do anything about this, but like, you can. Um, so sorry, I don't know where I'm going with that, but apparently like, it resonated with a lot of people. And it was mostly because I made the decision to use really evocative language and to really tie it concretely to children. Um, and so the, another fact is that they are going to have more, um, they're going to overheat more. And part of the reason they overheat more is because they go outside more. And like everyone remembers playing outside as a kid. Um, and I had listened to the youth climate marches, which are happening. And so I made a decision to sort of, one of the uh, speakers had talked about how like this is all happening on the backdrop of the youth climate marches, and so I, like and she's like kids today are actually wondering whether or not they should have children, and um, I remember that one of the protesters had um, said something in her or one of the activists that had been protesting Jamie Margolin I think had given congressional testimony earlier this year it was her Greta and two people I'm linking on right now um, and she had said something about how like everyone who will come up to her after the talk um, telling her she has such a bright future in front of her was lying to their face, to her face, because it, she was committed to a planet that was dying. Um, and I'm getting verklempt. So when I saw it the first time, I had a gut punch. And it just felt like a good quote to end the piece on. And so I did, um, because I'm probably the only person who watched uh, the congressional hearing. Um, <laughs> and so I don't know how many people actually heard her say it, uh, just because apart from the current impeachment proceedings, um, <laughs> uh, congressional hearings are not generally must see TV. And so I think. I think you don't always, like, I think the problem with phrases like climate crisis or climate emergency is that you run the risk of them just becoming another thing people say. Um, you know, we have the war on terrorism, we have the war on cancer, we have all of these languages, but like, we haven't actually solved those problems. And so um, I think naming things appropriately matters, but I think it can become too easy that the, the words are sort of decoupled from the problem. And so I think it can also become a crutch. And so in some ways, our decision not to use it means that I have to work harder to convey the scale of the problem. Um, and I think that is a good thing, because the problem is really big. And so I need people to kind of get a gut punch when they're reading about that scale. Yeah, no, I think that's a really, that's really interesting, because it's sort of the Sorry, idea. that was long. You know, it's like, no, <laughs> it's not long. It's, it's show, you know, it's show, don't, don't tell, or preach, or, or whatnot. But so, but still, still, still on that same subject. I'm curious. So, well, 
Every, climate stories are a bummer, right? And, and sometimes people don't click on them. It's hard being a journalist covering it, I know. Um, so how do, you, how do you do it, right? Like how do you do it? Because a goal of a journalist is to get someone to read the story, right? So if you're kind of up against something, which we all know it's pervasive right now in society, is that people are like, I don't even want to you know, look at the news, this, that, everything. So how do, you, how do you approach stories trying to get people into them to read them? Because that's your goal. I mean, I think it's, it's just find, find a story I think that's relatable. You know? And that's why we went after the offset story mm -hmm. so much with, with going to Brazil. Um, the combination of, of the great art direction, we, we hired a local photographer who knows that part of Brazil really well. Mm -hmm. um, and he, his English was also really good. And he took these amazing photos that we used throughout the story. Um, we also hired an illustrator to draw some illustrations for it. Um, it was just a really compelling story visually, and we hoped that would draw some readers in. But also, again, offsets are something that I think a lot of people can understand, and perhaps many people have personally bought offsets. You know, if you take a plane flight, oftentimes at the end there's a button you can click and you pay $5 and you offset your emissions and you feel great about yourself. There's just not a lot of transparency about exactly what projects you're funding, um, and certainly holes in how the monitoring process for those projects are going, as, as we showed through our reporting. So I, th I'm, I definitely got a lot of feedback from readers who said, you know, hey, I bought carbon offsets a while back. Now I'm wondering if they actually worked, or I'm wondering how well they worked. You know, and I, and I personally, maybe five or seven years ago, I remember buying some offsets myself um, shortly after the UN, I think, started a portal where you could easily buy offsets. And I bought it a few times and didn't think much about it and moved on. And in the course of reporting this story, I flew all the way to Brazil, first to Sao Paulo, and then all the way west to the extreme western part of Brazil, then flew to a city in the middle, and then back to Sao Paulo. And, and I flew so many miles. And then I got back and thought, I don't know what offsets I can buy because I don't know if I can trust anything. Because I had reported on the story on how untrustworthy untrust many of them are. So I was stuck in a position thinking, I can't even make myself feel better about the carbon footprint <laughs> that I spewed while reporting this. Um, and you know, I don't, I don't have a good solution for that. I right. would perhaps like to write a story maybe to find the best offset projects out there, because there are good ones. Um, they just may not be involving these tree projects in the right. same way. Um, but there's a whole world of many other offset type projects out there that I haven't looked deeply into. Yeah. Um, and, and I was wondering for Kendra, as you, you write, like, I, I loved your Close That Last story. Uh, you know, yeah. It was like really good. And it was, but you, you and I, I think you have more, because you're doing these long, you, like, you have more freedom to try to find things that I think that people feel like they can actually so help solve a little bit. Yeah. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that, because um, it feels that feels important. So that was, um, we have this feature in our newsletter called like One Thing You Can Do. Mm -hmm. And it's this tension, right? Because we recognize the limits of individual actions. And so we don't want to give people a bunch of, like, I don't know, um, use, don't use a straw advice that we know doesn't actually shift the actual impact. Um, but at the same time, people want to do something. And so sometimes the one thing you can do is literally like a thing like, you know, wash your clothes on cold. And sometimes the one thing you can do is, um, one I think we said was like go to your community board meetings and go to your planning board meetings and like actually get engaged in where things are getting cited in your community and are you citing things in flood zones? Are you guys going to be on the hook for a tremendous amount of money like in the future? Um, but one of the things that we were constantly getting a lot of like emails about was like, well, what about clothes? What about sustainable fashion? The footprint of fashion is so big. And the problem with fashion is that um, a lot of companies are saying that they're doing great things. Uh, but um, once you start talking to the experts about like who's actually like wh how much transparency is actually behind what they're doing, um, it gets really uh, like fuzzy. And basically, the only name company name that comes up repeatedly over and over again is Patagonia. Um, and even by Patagonia's own measure, they're like not doing enough. And I'm not being critical of them, but they are rec they they themselves recognize the limits of what they have accomplished. And also, you can't live in 
Patagonia everywhere. Um, <laughs> I, um, I don't think they make suits yet. Um, so that, that itself offers some limits. And, um, and then there were these companies, like a lot of the fast fashion companies are doing things like offering up 100% um, organic cotton t-shirts. And that makes you feel good because you're not using pesticides. But cotton t-shirt, organic cotton often uses more water. And it's often grown in very thirsty places. So you're actually trading off to very, like, I don't know how you do that accounting. Um, but the one thing that we know is that if you buy something and it lasts a long time, you've already reduced your footprint. So the one thing you can do is buy less clothes. But um, if you're sort of under the age of 40, 45, you've probably not grown up in an era where clothes actually last. So like, how do you buy clothes that last if you don't know what to look for? And so that was sort of the genesis yeah. of this piece, which is how do you buy clothes that last? Um, and it really resonated with readers. Um, we, I, like I mentioned, we had an art director. so. Um, we actually hired a fashion photographer to go out and like visualize all of, I, w I really wanted to crash her photo shoot, but I didn't, yeah. um, uh, to like visualize all of the, um, like the tips and it was like really beautifully and artfully shot. Um, and we um, put it in a little Easter egg, which was like a, a fake Instagram account. So if you like found it, um, and we did like some of the clips on Instagram, so that would, you know, because there are a lot of influencers. And then there were other things that I did that I didn't even, I did kind of consciously, which is often, um, so there is this like slow fashion movement, and there are some really kind of famous names within um, that movement. Like so, Olivia Firth, who's Colin Firth's wife, has like is a big purveyor of slow fashion. But I kind of made a, a conscious decision not to use some of the biggest names in slow fashion. I actually went the opposite route, and I found um, like women of color who often don't get enough. Um, recognition within the influencer movement. And I spend way too much time on the internet. Uh, <laughs> and I, um, I found a PhD student in the UK who is running a slow fashion project. And I chose to highlight them instead. And um, you know, she emailed me and she was like, we had, I don't remember the number, but like, you know, like the amount of traffic she like normally gets in a year, I got her in a week, um, which was like just like a nice aside. Um, and it, and um, and like somebody tagged me and wanted and somebody tagged the influencer and let her know that she was mentioned in my story. I didn't I didn't think to tell her not because it wasn't a bad story. Like it was, you think you think yeah. to warn people when you're writing something terrible about them, but when you're writing something nice you about them, you don't think about telling them. <laughs> and I didn't. And she was like was like so shocked and so pleased. And so it was just like this. I don't know, this added benefit that I didn't think about what, like, I didn't, I didn't think, I don't I, this is dumb, but I didn't think how nice it is to be in the New York Times when you're from a group that isn't often represented in the Times. Um, so that was really nice. I don't know why I threw yeah. that in there, but it was really nice. No, it's, it, was, it was, and it's, it's a story that you can actually, you know, people really want to feel a sense of solution and, and that felt like you could do something. Yeah, and it was, um, and, and the other reason, sorry, the other reason we went that route is we didn't want to tell people, like if you, we didn't want to be like buy this brand and the brand is very expensive. Um, and so if you're going to a thrift shop, the tips still work. If you're going to like, I know the fanciest department store, the tips still work. If, even if you're going to a fast fashion retailer, the tips work. Um, and so that was the other reason we kind of decided to go in that direction. Yeah, that's great. The, um, I, I, I don't want to monopolize all the time, but I do want to talk about something that's really important that, that is someone who's not writing right now, but I struggled with it, and I think a lot of journalists struggle with it, and it's, it's, it's environmental justice because it's so, it's so incredibly important. But I'll tell you sort of like I talked to some... I kind of did a, a survey from journalist friends of mine in the environmental field, and I know a lot of them, and... And, and most of them were, were older, they're like my age, you know, in the 50s. And um, they said it, it's really hard to write about um, because it's super important, but sometimes the stories can feel familiar. And, and I don't know if you feel that way or not, but so that's the first question, if you feel that way. And secondly, if you, whether or not, how do, you, how do you write about environmental justice so it's part of this, this climate beat and so it's sort of woven into it in a way that, um, or do you just hit it straight on every single time? And is that as effective? So, I, I think that um, oftentimes environmental justice may be sort of one step removed from the central thing you're writing about <laughs> it if, if it's a pure climate story. Um, but uh, other times it fits in really well. And when it does, you definitely need to tell that. And, and I think. I didn't think about the Brazil story as a climate justice story or environmental justice, but there is an element in there of it, right? And part of the part of the reason why offsets are a lot of people support offsets is this idea that 
the global north, you know, has profited and gained so many riches and privileges from the ability to emit carbon dioxide unchecked, and that um, though the countries that have more poverty and are in the global south, we are now saying you can't emit CO2 and not enjoy, you know, we're not allowing you to enjoy the cheap, fast route to get richer, and that's just, you know, not right. And so perhaps if we can move some money from the global north to the global south to help them protect trees, and at the same time, you know, alleviate some of our guilt in emitting, then everything will be perfect and work out. Um, but of course, that's not, that doesn't work. And so what our story was saying is, the, the best way to do that is just for the global north to be generous and pay the sort of money to help others adapt. But because our political climate is such that we are not generous enough, rich nations feel they need to get something in return. And that's, what the offset, that's where the offsets come in. So it becomes, you know, there is an element and theme about poverty uh, woven in and, and, and justice. And, you know, we quoted community members who say, you know, the easiest way for me to send my kids to school to get electricity and running water is to cut down trees and have cattle. And I can earn you know, hundreds of times more money by <clears throat> selling some cattle to, for beef than by doing these supposedly sustainable alternative livelihoods that you know, people in the US want me to do and just pay me a few dollars. So that is an element of it, but I didn't approach the story thinking about it as an EJ story. It just sort of happened. Um, and then sometimes in other stories, you know, sometimes I do stories where it doesn't fit in and doesn't make it into the story or makes it in in a sort of um, abbreviated form. Um, and other times it, it, it just really depends on what the central story is you're trying to tell. Um, <clears throat> so I guess I feel like for me there are two strands. I have done a couple sort of explicit environmental justice stories. Um, so one I did. Um, I was listening to a podcast about, um, it doesn't matter what, but anyway, somebody referenced, <laughs> it's, uh, somebody referenced the fact that, um, you know, in parts of California, in parts of LA, that um, uh, black and brown communities are physically hotter than, um, like, white communities. So in summer, they get hotter. Um, and I was like, well, that's weird. And so I did some digging. I found their, they mentioned the, re they didn't interview her, but they mentioned the researcher's name. So I, I found her, and I called her up, and I didn't have a story. And it, but it was very much like, hey, I just think that's interesting. What else have you got? And one of the things that she said was, um, communities that are more segregated in the United States have higher overall levels of air pollution than communities that are more integrated. Um, and I was like, huh, that's weird. Um, and the problem, but I ran into a problem. So I work for a newspaper, which means it needs to be new. Um, and her research was a couple of years old. By chance, um, we were doing the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King, so they were doing this big package. And I was like, King said something about how segregation was bad. Um, <laughs> 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 Maybe I can tie the two together. <laughs> um, and so I talked to these researchers, and then my editor at the time is really awesome, and he was like, um, you know, I think based on what you've got so far, you should talk to a King historian. So I found a King historian who's great. He actually talked to me outside the barber shop. Uh, <laughs> um, and um, I did a story about um, sort of how, like, King said segregation uh, was not just bad for black people, it was bad for white people, and when it comes to pollution, it's true, or something like that. I don't remember the exact title. It's been a couple of years. Um, because I, of that story, um, a few months later, um, Al Gore's people reached out, and they said, hey, uh, we're going to North Carolina to hang out with Reverend Barber. Do you want to come? And I said, heck yeah. <laughs> um, and so they were going down to North Carolina because you guys know who Reverend Barber is? Um, for those of you who don't know, he's a, an African-American preacher from North Carolina. Um, and for the past, um, I don't know, five, maybe longer, but he was running this campaign called um, Moral Monday. So every um, Monday, like it was a lot of like uh, getting people to vote and like getting arrested for sort of social political reasons around equity and racial equity. And uh, I guess it was last year, he was um, relaunching Martin Luther King Jr.'s Poor People's Campaign, and he was um, adding eco-justice to the platform. That's why Al Gore was coming down. So I went down to North Carolina. Um, I toured a community that had been um, impacted by coal ash. I drove out. Um, I had some issues with my flight. So I ended up driving out after everybody um, and went out to the facility just to see the plant. And I interviewed a lot of people who found that they had a lot of, um, who claimed that they had a lot of ailments from 
collage. And in the No Surprises story, I called the energy company that they were blaming. And it's the first time I'm mostly a science reporter, so I talk to scientists, and they like me, and I like them. Um, and it's great. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm being a little bit glib, but um, it was the first time I'd ever really had a straight adversarial um, interview. Um, so I literally ended with a PR person screaming at me. Um, and then I hung up the phone very shaken. Um, and then the PR person emailed my boss. Um, and so that was a new experience to me. How did they figure out who your boss was? I don't know. I really don't. That's very difficult. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, so that was exciting. Um, so, so there are those stories. Um, and then on the other side, um, like recently I did a story, um, a really short story, very image driven, about um, the bleaching of the coral reefs in Hawaii. And so I was talking to this researcher, and I was like, hey, you know, most, and this is a thing that I think about a lot with coral reefs, which is that most people who live in the United States will never see one. Um, we don't, except for Florida we, and, the, and our islands in the Caribbean and Hawaii, we don't really have any like in continental United States that are, or, apart from cold water, but that's not what I'm talking about. Um, and you need a submarine for those anyway. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is a problem of knowing too much. Um, but um, so I always, whenever possible, try to link it back to people who are impacted. And because coral reefs are like really critical ecosystems in um, the areas of the world, tropical coral reefs are really critical for food in the parts of the world where they show up. So I was talking to this researcher and I was like, hey, is there someone in Hawaii that I could talk to who like this matters to in a way that's more than just science? So he found I mean, this guy who's great, who lives in one of the last traditional Hawaiian villages um, on that island. And so I interviewed him, and, um, and I put him in the story. And so that's the other way that I think eco-justice plays out, is that we is, um, there's a, a thread in sort of eco-justice movements, which is community speak for themselves, which often makes it really difficult to talk to eco-justice groups because they don't want to talk to you. They're like, go talk to this person in the community. And you're like, great, but I want to talk about the work you're doing. No, go talk to this person in the community. But what about the work you're doing? Um, and so I think as a reporter, that's, that is actually a really valid thing, is like let people speak for themselves. And it doesn't always have to be this like, this thing is happening to them. They are participants in what is happening. Um, I'm not saying that they're causing it, but they, they are actors in this process. And so it helps to allow them to have that voice. And so that's the other way that um, I think is valid and also, yeah. Um, is yeah, trying to find that voice, making sure that um, as much as possible, if you're reporting touches on a community, that someone in that community is in your story, um, which isn't always easy, um, especially if you're used to talking to scientists all the time. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, it's really interesting, because that idea of um, including people in the stories as opposed to, right, going to someone, this is happening to someone, changes the whole dynamic of a story and can make it much richer. I think everyone knows that when they see it. It yeah. just that still doesn't happen very often, actually. You know, It takes effort and thought. And you both have, um, and this may not be completely true for you, but luxury of, of resources and, and, mm -hmm. and some time, right? I mean, I'm sure you're yeah. incredibly busy, both of you. But, but um, so, it, well, two things. If you have a question, I don't want to... Board. So please start. So there is one down. thing that I want to, yeah. and this is something that I learned the hard way. This happened to me twice, where um, I showed up in towns and there is like a large Native American population and nobody had told me. <laughs> um, so like when you're talking to researchers and you're like, is there anyone else I should talk to? You? Even non-scientists, you should like kind of be like more explicit that it's like I'm like, are there community members that I should talk to? Um, because people forget. Um, they get into their brain and they forget. And it's the same with sourcing. Um, I will tell someone, I am, is there a woman? Can I, you know, like, I've got three dudes. Can I find a woman? Um, can I find a woman of color? Can I find, you know, a, a person of color? Um, when I did that King piece, um, I found an African American King historian because all of my experts on the piece were white. Um, it was really important to have that voice in there. Um, I didn't, yeah. yeah. That's great. The, um, um, so, so I, I, I'm just, if you have a question, come to the mic. I have a lot more questions, but um, please, and we'll start having, getting conversation going. But so, but just on, on this, I think that's great. A lot of other journalists don't have those resources, right? Like you guys are are, are very lucky, I think, in that. And then, so two, two questions. Um, it's not really advice for journalists, but it's 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 how do you how do you can you do that quickly? And and second of all, 
this is a bigger question, but what, what's, what angle's not being covered in climate that you feel, just personally? Um, oh, gosh. The first oh, one can we start? Is there something that we're missing? Because there's a lot of climate news out yeah, there, right? Uh, so what are we not doing? I got that one. Is, okay. uh, yeah, it, uh, drought, because uh, it's really hard to cover because it's super slow moving. And um, like dirt looks like, what do, you sh what do you shoot? What do you photograph? <laughs> <laughs> so um, it, it has this tremendous impact. It's really important. Mm -hmm. um, but it is very difficult to talk about. Um, and then you end up with like the Cape Town problem where everyone was like, Cape Town's running out of water and then Cape Town didn't run out of water. Um, <laughs> so like there's this real risk of becoming like the boy who called wolf. And I'm not trying to minimize Cape Town's problems, but like, um, so like, yeah, drought in particular is really mm -hmm. difficult. Do you have anything to say? Yeah, you know, I, okay, this is gonna sound funny because I, I don't do this, but I would love to see more, um, solutions climate journalism in a way yeah. that is perhaps more analytical and talking about here's a thing that actually worked and is anyone actually working to maybe scale it up so it's not just one neighborhood or one town. Um, I spent a lot of time after Hurricane Harvey reporting on the hurricane in Houston. Uh, I was reporting actually from my office in New York which was difficult but um, one thing that we kept hearing was oh you know the greatest success story in relocating an entire town or an entire community after flooding is this town in Illinois, I think it was called Valmeyer mm -hmm. or something. And then I called up the former mayor of Val Valmeyer and he's like, yeah, there were, you know, like 300 of us or something. It was some very <laughs> small number. And I'm looking at the data from the city of Houston with thousands upon thousands of requests for buyouts after the hurricane and just thinking, this wonderful success story, which everyone knows about, is completely not applicable to the disaster you're seeing in Houston, yet everyone talks about it like we should follow their example. And I'm thinking, who is actually going to make this work? And so we ended up doing a story, which was not a solution story, about <laughs> how backed up Houston's system was and that the, the Houston and Harris County had probably the most sophisticated system for trying to get as much money as possible for buyouts. And they were really working hard, and they had all this great data and effort, but they were something like 10 years behind on their backlog. You know, it was, it was mm -hmm. tremendous, the demand for people who wanted money to relocate to less flood-prone places versus the actual resources they had. Um, and, you know, I would love to just see more coverage of solutions that work and how to apply them in multiple places. I want to talk more about solutions, but do, do you have a question, and then we can come? I was wondering, you know, in within the past year, there has been a truly astonishing increase in awareness um, surrounding climate change. There have been, you know, millions of people protesting and all this kind of stuff. And I was wondering, as climate reporters, what kind of additional kind of benefits and challenges does that offer to your coverage now that there's, like, more of kind of... Uh, a kind of laser focus than ever before on the issue? Um, I think the benefit is that people are paying attention. Um, and I think uh, institutionally more people are paying attention. Um, but also, um, I think it's interesting there's a split. So like I think um, print and new media um, gets it. And they really are devoting resources and trying to convey like the magnitude of um, climate coverage. I think, um, except for like Vice had that show in HBO, they were kind of the one exception. I think it's less true with TV news. And I think people overestimate our reach. Um, not as m many people, I'm guessing, you know, like millions of people a night watch TV. And I don't think any print publication has that equivalent of. You know, like, I don't think that, and I don't look at my numbers, they don't let us, but um, I don't think that that many people read, like, you know, like, you know, Chris, you know, 10 million people tune into, like, cable news shows a night in an hour. I don't think I get 10 million people clicking on my story. Do you know what I'm saying? And so I think that, I think, is the debt, like, there, yeah. So I think there's a, that split. I think the upside is the attention. I think the downside is, and I know this a lot, this is kind of what, what was also sort of the thread running through that fire story is that there's a lot of miscommunication 
I think that there are a lot of reporters who haven't covered science and haven't covered climate change before who are now becoming climate change reporters, and it's great. The more the merrier. I'm not besmirching them. But um, I, I did, this is kind of a jerk, but like, uh, there was a fire that happened. I'm not going to say where because then you'll be able to find the reporting. And it was a natural fire. It was like, there was some, I mean, there were some issues with the ecosystem around ag, but basically, like, it, it's a fire based ecosystem. Nobody lives near it. It made local media because there are mandatory reporting requirements when smoke hits a road, but it was like, it was a nothing burger fire that, like, blew up all over social media because an outlet chose to report on it and make it a really big deal. Um, and say it was climate change, and it like just it what and I like was like, am I? You know, it wasn't. Another a fire scientist that I really like was on Twitter was like yelling at people, and I was like, cool, I'm not wrong. I was like, it's gonna rain tomorrow. Like, like it, like it really is okay. Like it is fine. Um, and and that drives me nuts because um, I often feel like you only get one shot, and so once people have the wrong idea in their head. Um, it's really hard to change their minds. Previously, we thought um, like science literacy was the solution to climate denialism, and it's, it seems like now like power literacy um, is also really important for general audiences to understand um, the political economy of the society that we live in, where we support fossil fuels. Um, and I was just wondering what you guys thought about that, um, like whether that is part of your goal as journalists. And this, the related question is whether any aspect of your reporting would change um, if the primary audience were activists and not necessarily um, people in power who had um, the power to change legislation, for example, but the people who actually could use this to um, organize and be activists. You know, I, I think that, it, I'll answer the second question first. If our primary audience was activists, probably the biggest change would be um, not having to explain everything from scratch and being able to use more jargon, perhaps. And so that's why I feel, I, you know, I feel like activists should be reading our stories and shouldn't have any trouble understanding it because it's just stating a lot of what they already know in plain language. Um, and and you know, on the issue of, of, of power imbalance, one thing that's become very clear and um, I think can make stories and makes a really compelling story is the idea that a lot of people think the environmental movement is a monolith, and it really isn't. And it's increasingly clear that there's often a real split between the big national, well-funded environmental organizations and the smaller localized environmental justice organizations that are often run by communities of color and based locally. Um, and, and you know, I just did a story on cap and trade in California, and those two groups were on polar opposites of how they felt about cap and trade. Um, and so, you know, I, I covered that. The, the story covered the, the differences in those opinions. Um, and, and also, you end up finding, I think, justice elements that you may not necessarily think of, because you also have to think about economic injustice, including from people who don't see themselves as climate activists and how they can sometimes be used by either side. Um, so one unexpected story I found when I wrote about cap and trade was I, I heard, sorry, cap and trade is this confusing market mechanism where you uh, give out a bunch of limited permits to emit CO2 and then companies buy them and they can trade. So, you know, a it allows companies to maybe emit more than they did the year before, but as long as someone else is emitting less than they were, then everything balances out. But what I had discovered in reporting on this was there was a lot of flaws in the cap and trade program in California, and I started hearing rumors that there had been this public regulatory hearing and that there were these groups of minority residents who seemed to have shown up at the meeting and perhaps were being managed by oil and gas somehow to talk about how making cap and trade more stringent would increase fuel prices and <clears throat> impact them on an economic level adversely. And it was a weird rumor. And I started looking at this. So I watched the video, five hour video of the hearing. And then I noticed very clearly this block of black pastors from Los Angeles. They stated their names in the video. So I looked them up and started calling them. I visited two of them. And they basically said, oh yeah, we were approached by this consulting firm who said they would fly us to Sacramento for the hearing 
so we could talk about our economic concerns with this regulation. And then through lobbying records, I figured out that consulting firm was being paid by this nonprofit that was mostly funded by oil and gas. And the thing was, these pastors did not know their trip was funded by oil and gas interests. They were not told that. And in fact, they had a history of local advocacy against oil and gas drilling in their own neighborhoods. So this was a case where they had no idea what was going on. And when I told them, they were very disappointed and very shocked. You know, they were very proud of their local environmental activism. They definitely cared about their communities. And the economic concerns they shared at the hearing were genuine. But it was a total shock to them that they were, you know, they had been funded by interests that were opposite of what they normally supported. Um, and so I think drilling down to those kinds of power dynamics and, and revealing them is, is, is just a really important thing for, for all stories. And uh, I live in Germany currently. And so one thing that I observe is that there's quite a, a big difference in, in climate like awareness, but probably also reporting between, say, like Europe and, and the US. And so I wondered if you had any insights like what might contribute to this, and, and also if, if you have any particular like challenges um, of maybe like reporting of a global problem like climate change to, to a US audience? I mean, like we do still have, I mean, one of the biggest differences is we do still have a sustained climate denialist movement. Um, and so one of the things when I bring this up that I always want to put in context is actually only about 13% of um, people in the United States don't accept the science of climate change. So they're in the sheer minority. Um, there are some people, um, when you include people who are like, I don't know what is happening, you get to about 30%. So that's 13% denialists and 17% just sort of head scratching. But the overwhelming majority of American, the, you can look this up, it's Yale Climate Communication has really good stats on this. The overwhelming majority of Americans accept the science. I think there are only two counties in the United States where it's less than 50%. So that's just like, I want to make that really clear that that's kind of the backdrop which we're operating under. Um, as Lisa's reporting has unveiled, the and um, what's her name, Naomi Oreski over at Harvard has done a lot of great work sort of highlighting the degree to which oil and gas companies have worked to perpetuate um, the, this disinformation. Um, this disinformation campaign has only essentially happened in four countries. It's happened uh, in the United States primarily. A little bit has happened in the UK. It's happening in Australia still and a little bit in Canada. And so what that has meant is that while other countries had sort of accepted the science and their news media had accepted the science a really long time ago, um, when Inside Climate News started when, 10 years ago? 2009, I think. It was somewhat yeah. radical that they were reporting on climate change from the position that it was happening and that they weren't going to debate the science anymore. Um, so there's been a really large shift within um, media to sort of report from the perspective that climate change is happening and we're done with the debate and that's just sort of how we're, the position we're operating from. And so I think that's partly what factors into how that, that, that conversation is happening. If you're wondering why there, there's such a sustained denialist movement in the United States in those four countries, uh, part of it is um, a strong fossil fuel sector. With the exception of the UK, all of these countries have large private fossil fuel um, sectors, so that's a huge part of it. Part of it is this um, idea of freedom and this idea of the frontier and this idea that you can't mess with me. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, neoliberal capitalism, basically, um, and uh, English. Uh, and it's not that there's anything unique about English. It just makes it really easy to disseminate the information between those countries. Um, so like, I'm sure if we were speaking German, then Germany might have more of a problem. <laughs> just so, um, and so in, a, in some sense, um, we are historically really behind in other countries in terms of popular media sort of reporting on it as a fact. So that's a huge part of it. Um, and then, you know, we have governments um, that don't accept the science either. So like, it's not just that they're, you know, the 13% if um, they were not in positions of power, the, the discussion might be very different. But we have a president who is on record as not accepting the science. Um, and we have many politicians in positions of power who don't accept the science. And so we are in a position, I think, as a country where we can't just sort of say this is what's happening and act on it. Um, we're still in some ways re 
redoing that debate. Um, it's not playing out in the media anymore. It is playing out politically. But that does mean um, when um, a politician says something that about climate change that is um, not that it's not happening, um, we do still, in many cases, have an obligation, depending on the context, to report that. Um, and so that means that, like, yeah. Does that make any sense? Sorry, I like <laughs> that. Dot, dot. It, it, no, it, it, it does make sense. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. Let me get another, let me get a question in, but I'd like to follow up on that after. Yeah, my name is George Mokre. Uh, for the last 10 years, I've been publishing a free weekly that looks at what's happening at the colleges and universities in the community about energy and other things. So a lot of it is about climate change, because there's all these discussions all the time around here. Um, First, a, a piece of information. I started buying a bundle of trees from Heifer International in the 80s. Right? And after about 10 or 20 years, I realized if I buy a bundle of trees every year, which is about 100 trees that are then planted out by indigenous people through Heifer International, that's carbon offset. Right? So when I fly, I buy a bundle of trees from Heifer International. And they don't advertise it as being carbon off offset, but I think that it is. About 20 years ago, uh, I asked science fiction writers about positive futures, and they didn't have any idea. There are very few positive futures. If we look at our, our media, if we look at our fiction, we don't have it. Everything. We're still Mad Max, right? It's still about oil and gas. But there are all those kinds of solutions that are there. So how do we overcome this lack of imagination about solutions, even simple solutions, very simple solutions, like the idea of carbon offset through a tree program, which is not related to climate change, or the fact that I carry a, a $10 solar bike light on my backpack, which can also charge something, which would also be essential power for the, the billion or, or so people who don't have access to light or a cell phone. And it's 10 bucks retail online. So, and we're not recognizing this stuff. So how do you do this? How do you get the solutions out there? How do you talk about carbon drawdown? How do you talk about soil carbon sequestration? That all of these things are there. Or Tom Garo's idea of bio rock, which keeps corals alive when they're bleaching. So, it, so, so are you talking not, not just from a consumer standpoint, but in general solutions? Well, it's, there seems to be a lack of imagination in the culture about any kind of positive future that is not from the 1950s. Um, there's a, a book called, if someone has a phone, I think it's The Great Disruption, or The Great, oh god, I can't remember. I can picture the cover. It's blue and relatively recent, and I will, I don't know. Um, I think, is it? Who's it by? No, 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 no. I, this guy is um, like Indian. Thank you. What's, what's the book? What? The Great Derangement. Thank you. The Great what? The Great Derangement. Who talks a little? Yeah, Derangement. Who talks a little bit about like um, that tension? How a lot of the futures are um, in like serious novels is tends to be relegated to um, science fiction and how there aren't a lot of positive futures. But I would say like the best example I can think of is Black Panther. Um, and <laughs> not just because of vibranium, and, um, and not just because it was an awesome movie, but also if you look at great Black Panther, there is an urban core and there is a countryside, but it doesn't actually have a um, suburbs. And the city center doesn't have paved roads. So they're, so like they're, those visions are out there. They're just you have to look a little bit more to see them, and in case you have to be really nerdy to notice details that like 
there are no paved roads in Wakanda. <laughs> and there are actually no roads in Wakanda because you know the, it flies. So the sidewalks, I should say, are unpaved. <laughs> but it, but it gets to this issue that we talked about a little bit earlier about about have it, everyone here know about so the what is it solution journalism, journalism project network, network have, I think network have you guys heard of it so it, so it's a cool effort to to write about solutions to problems with the rigor that you apply to investigative journalism and it, it's 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 a, it's a good idea it, it's it's very hard to do so. <laughs> And I just would love, Lisa, just like uh, just touch on solutions. Like, is it is it important for journalists to, and is it your job to give everyday solutions to people as well as sort of broader solutions to explain them? And and how do you how do you how do you balance that against the the need to report on the news and this? Yeah, yeah. You know, I I think um, we do oftentimes at ProPublica will spend an entire year writing about the problem in increasingly depressing chapters of a story, and then maybe at the end of the year, a few stories about solutions. You know, here is one state that is doing this thing well, whereas the state we wrote about is failing at it. Or here's one company that is making some inroads, here's one happy story about this thing. Um, we don't do it very often, because that is not the core of why we're here, but we have sometimes created, depending on the project, um, kind of user's guides um, to help people advocate for themselves. So we have these great healthcare journalists who've created guides on when you're at the hospital, here's what you do to make sure you don't get charged and get ridiculous surprise bills. You know, here are the steps of, of what to do. Um, a couple years ago, one of my colleagues did a great series on the problem of maternal mortality in the US, how women giving birth in the US are at much higher risk of injury and deaths than almost any other developed nation. And at the end of that, we publish an entire user's guide on, you know, if you are the spouse or family member of the person giving birth in the hospital, here are the steps you take to make sure all of your concerns are addressed, to make sure the risks are, you know, uh, taken care of as much as possible. Here's what you do to reduce the risk that your loved one might, you know, suffer or die or, or get injured in the process. So I think those kinds of Practical guides are very important. Um, I have not found a way to do one of those in my reporting so far. Um, but I think a lot of daily newspapers and, and, and other publications do a better job on, on and do a lot more reporting on consumer-oriented um, you know, advice. And there's certainly a lot of stories out there saying, OK, what can you as a single person do for climate change? And oftentimes, it comes down to voting. You know, vote and get involved in local politics, because that's where you as an individual often can make the, the biggest difference. Yeah. I, th I also think, like, um, I think with The Globe just did that awesome article about like how bad um, traffic is in Boston. And the thing is, is like everybody, like transportation planners know that building roads doesn't reduce congestion, it, ad it just adds to it, right? Like there are all of these things that like the solutions are like known, it's just that the political will isn't there to do them. Yeah. So that's, that's the right. other tension, right? Like, we need mass investment in mass transit. That's the only thing that actually reduces traffic. But like, we don't do that in this country. Um, so like, yeah, so like that's the other tension with solution stories is that, off, that sometimes the solutions are just so obvious and everybody knows what they are. But like, there's no movement on them. There's yeah. no movement on them, often for value and socio-political reasons, um, as opposed to for technical reasons. Go ahead. Hi, thanks. I'm Jenny. I'm with Living on Earth. We're a public radio program that Lisa Song interned at, I think, a few years ago. Um, and uh, we have a podcast as well, so please subscribe. Um, but one thing I'm thinking about a lot right now is the upcoming UNFCCC um, Conference of the Parties climate meetings that are going to happen in Madrid after being moved from Chile, from Santiago. And there's going to be a lot of discussion there. Of course, the US is stepping back from its role in this global movement um, to have some kind of agreement about what are we doing about climate change. And so I'm wondering to what extent you feel that kind of conversation, like covering these meetings, um, is important to your audiences and something that you should you know, be informing them about, because I, I feel like it's not co that covered in the media. It's just not that sexy of a thing to, to report on. Um, and also, how do you try to go about that and sort of like draw out the most salient, important parts of that kind of like really high level 
diplomacy for your general audiences? I'm, I'm, I'm laughing because at Inside Climate News, it was a, always a, a great discussion yeah. about should you go to the... Anyway, I mean, I'm going to be honest and say it's really boring yeah. to go and cover those conferences. Um, it's, it's a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of jargon, way more acronyms than anyone should ever have to deal with. And, you know, un unfortunately, oftentimes there's not a lot of movement. You, you know, I, I covered some of the events. I went to some of the events in September during Climate Week in New York because I was right there. And I came away with it thinking, Nobody's really talking about reducing the use of fossil fuels, which is the bottom line thing you need. Everyone is talking about, there was so much more discussion of carbon trading and offsets, but nobody used the word offsets. And they used all these other euphemisms. And I complained enough about it that my editor just said, why don't you just write that story? So I ended up writing a story that was not focused on the step-by-step -step events of the meeting, but on this one slice about a topic that I'd spent months researching and could write about you know, quickly and with authority. And that's sort of how we tend to cover those events. We don't cover, we know there's, there were hundreds and hundreds of reporters covering these meetings actually during Climate Week. It was very encouraging to see the giant media tent filled to capacity. So there was plenty of daily coverage of what's actually happening. And we try to cover these kinds of things only when it falls into something that we can offer that's unique and new. Um, and and I, I think, I'm not sure why it seems like the, the reporting on these kinds of UN meetings tends to be more robust in a lot of European um, publications than, than US ones. Uh, I don't cover <laughs> the COP. Um, I have a coworker who does most of our foreign and international stuff, and she has spent a lot of um, time at the UN, and so she covers COP. I've never been to a COP. And during climate week, I only went to the side meetings. <laughs> yeah, it, it's very incremental. And I, I don't know who was first. It, so I think many of us here at MIT were engineers and scientists. So I was wondering if you have any advice for us on how to best communicate our work to journalists. Um, I like puns. No. Um, <laughs> Uh, it, I mean, it often helps, like, if you're doing something super technical, it really does help um, to have a really good analogy um, that you can give out. Um, ideally, if you're talking to a lot of journalists, have more than one so it doesn't look like we're all ripping each other off. Um, <laughs> uh, and then also, like, why does it matter is also so really important. So, um, uh, and, yeah, and sometimes if you have um, a really compelling story, so I did... Um, this isn't at the Times. This is when I was at PopSci. Um, there's an annual award. I think it's like the Golden Goose Award or something. I don't remember. But it award, rewards sort of basic science that have yielded um, unusual benefits. And so that year, it was like a frog, like a guy who studied um, like an insect or something and found an unusual glue. I don't remember the third guy, sorry. And this woman who essentially, um, she was the one who helped identify chytrid in frogs. Um, and I was kind of like, man, do I really have to do this? Do I really have to write an article about an award? Um, it, it doesn't get your blood racing, but I called her. So I wanted to call one of them, so I called her just by chance. And she had this amazing story, essentially, of like studying science in college and getting her master's degree. And then um, she's an older woman, and then quitting, um, deciding to be a stay-at-home mom for a really long time. Um, and then somebody called her because at that point she was still the foremost expert in this in chytrids because nobody cared about it. Um, and somebody convinced her to do a little bit. They had an, an, a, like a, a grant, and somebody convinced her to come out of like retirement. So she'd been out of the lab for like 20 years um, and do something in their lab for them. And she got the bug again, went back to get her PhD, um, like in her 40s, I think, um, and couldn't get funding to run her own lab. So it was literally carving out weird lab space out of somebody else's lab. Um, and when they first were sort of identifying what Kittred was, they like, were like, oh, um, who, they found somebody else and they contacted them. They're like, do you know what this is? And they're like, I don't know, but you should talk to this woman. And they did. And so it was like this really great story of this woman's life. Um, and it wouldn't have that, like, it would have been a much less rich article if she hadn't opened up to me. So sometimes if you're a story as to like why you got to do the thing that you're doing is really lovely, like don't be afraid of sharing that. I think the analogy people give is if you're studying something technical and you want a reporter to understand, pretend you're talking to your drunk uncle. You know, like someone who's 
who cares and really wants to understand, but you know, needs things broken down simply. So <laughs> that can help. And then if you're really interested in being a frequent source to reporters, there are actually trainings that are available to help scientists better communicate to the media. And I think those trainings can also teach you some of the rules of the road for journalism, so you're not shocked by you know, uh, how, how, how you may be described by the journalist, and, and you kind of know the, the practices and what's accepted and not in journalism. I, I'm just going to jump in, because I, I was a science reporter for many years at the Globe, and, and I used to teach MBL science communication to uh, postdocs for a while. And, and it's like building a relationship with the journalist early on is really important. And I'm also going to make a plug for my, so I don't feel like it's a plug for anything commercial, but it's, I think it's important. Uh, the Conversation, which is a nonprofit independent news site, but what we do is something different. We work with academics. Postdocs can write for us. Master students, if they have a professor. And, and they, we help translate their research under their byline into public interest journalism that then goes out on the AP wire. Um, goes to the Washington Post, many, many other places. So like, I'm just saying that's an option because every journalist I know goes on the conversation every day and then calls up all the people we help write and gets them on the radio interviews and the, you know what I mean? So I just, I'm throwing it out there because it's a, it's a good resource to get in front of journalists in a different way. I think what I have to ask, comment on, is uh, related to what George said. And he gave me courage to uh, stand up. <clears throat> you were talking about how it's kind of a downer so the problem of getting people to read about this. And um, I'm thinking of some publications. I mean, one question is whether you know the, the magazine Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, which is a quarterly. I had a subscription to it for a year, but I actually talked the Cambridge Public Library into subscribing to it. And um, <clears throat> as you know, then, if you're familiar with it, I mean, these are positive stories, obviously. And a lot of these things are <coughs> grassroots. I mean, it's what people are doing at the local level. So I think it does kind of give people hope and, um, and exposes them to possible, if not solutions. Solutions sounds like too big, too grand, but you know, things that people can do at least. And, and then there are these publications like, this is the Nature Conservancy, uh, the publication that they put out, which is also a quarterly and, and obviously the Sierra Club does the same kind of thing. But anyway, these are all kind of positive stories. Maybe part of their purpose is to get people to join and to contribute to their organizations, but they're not made up. So I just wonder what you, how you feel about these kind of publications, like Yes and the Nature Conservancy and Sierra Club, which really do have a lot of good stories. Yeah, positive. but more, I think, considered more advocacy-based, because they're, they're spurring public action, right? Right. But yeah. I mean, I, I read a lot of climate stories. You know, I, it's, I usually start by mor my mornings by getting the, um, the Climate Nexus newsletter. I'm trying to think of if that's the right name. But they do a roundup every day of um, climate-related stories from the day before. And I'll read and skim a lot. I'm on Twitter a lot. Um, and I try to keep some general understanding of all kinds of climate, everything happening in the climate space, even though I only write about small sections of it. Um, and you know, when good solution stories come out, I, I, I read them. It just depends on, but, but like I said, it, it tends not to be the focus of the kind of work that I, I do routinely. Mm -hmm. um, sort of similar, you know, I read Sierra, I read Audubon, um, but those are just different outlets. Um, and also I do a lot of like study reporting, and so um, there aren't that many positive climate change studies. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> I think we know why. <laughs> yeah. uh, go ahead. Hi, I'm Connor. Um, so uh, when you're talking about the phrase uh, climate crisis earlier, uh, and just you know the phrases that get used uh, over and over again, uh, remind me of this thing from last year uh, during the California fires, where Trump started using this phrase, I think, forest management, and that the problem is forest management. And I was like, huh, is he talking about controlled burns? That's really interesting. But then someone clued me into, no, actually, this is like a Trojan horse for logging. logging. Um, and I was like, oh, well, that, that completely could have got me unless someone had pointed this out. So anyway, I, I guess I was just curious, is this something that uh, you feel like comes up a lot, these sort of tro Trojan horse phrases, I guess? And are there any in particular that you try to avoid or you're, you're thinking about right now? <laughs> 
I try not to repeat political talking points, which is hard because political talking points um, become like language. Um, so I'm not saying I'm like perfect at it, but I do try to avoid them. Um, I spent a lot of time with thesaurus.com coming up with other <laughs> phrases. Um, I can't think of another one yeah, I... offhand. Um, I mean, this one's kind of obvious, but I, I really try to avoid saying forest fire because most, for it, most like especially like the California fire, fires, a lot of them are not in forests or in chaparral, they're in grasslands or brushlands. Um, so that's just like one that I try, and then you end up like with like a lot of like wonky wildland management because you're not tr you're trying not to say forest. Um, <laughs> um, so things like that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I can't think of any kind of political. Oh, I, I just thought of one. Uh, off the top of my head, it's more that we try to just avoid the jargony thing altogether, right? Uh, so in cap and trade, the actual permits you buy are called allowances. And I was thinking, nobody, nobody cares what an allowance is. Nobody needs to understand that word. So we just use the word permit. And so even if there was some political you know, slant to the word allowance, even if there was, we just don't have to worry about it because we're using a normal, common, everyday word. And so I think the, the thing we watch out for most is if a word is being used in the context of some jargon-specific policy thing, and it perhaps means something different from the way normal people understand it, then we find a way to take care of that, usually by using a synonym somehow. So I thought it would. I, I'm not very successful because um, editors, um, but I try not to use the phrase natural disaster. Um, I try, I kind of agree with um, natural um, hazard ex or disaster experts, which is a, a, a disaster is a natural hazard that meets the human population. So if you have a tornado and it, it doesn't, and it, I don't know, it goes through nowhere or like no community, then it's not a disaster, it's just a tornado. Um, and I think the problem with a natural disaster is it ignores the fact that oftentimes there are systems and processes that put people into harm's way, so it makes it seem inevitable, and that's not true. I'm an environmental journalist from Brazil, actually. <laughs> and, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, um, so uh, first I have only a brief comment to add into something you mentioned, uh, Kendra. I, I think the disinformation camp campaign uh, went far beyond these four countries that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. I, I agree that's exactly where like, the thing was stronger, but <laughs> Whatever happens here has several, uh, severe implications for, develop, for the yeah. developing countries, uh, especially with big markets like Brazil. So, and, and an important thing to say, I'm sorry for talking so much, but an important thing to say is that there's, there's, uh, there's a, there's, what is happening in Brazil right now is the uh, disinformation cam campaign produced by the government. Mm -hmm. It is very important to, whatever story you go to cover that, to be aware of that, especially with the fires. The, <laughs> the more, um, the current index was released, the deforestation index, mm -hmm. index was released Monday. Mm -hmm. And it is proven that um, the fires in August are directly uh, uh, connected with the, the, the increase in deforestation. deforestation. So yeah. we are not seeing, um, a growth that is connected with uh, past years. We are actually going back to uh, ten years uh, backwards. You know, it's a, it's it's a, it's a different situation. It's much worse. Um, Bolsonaro is a terrible <coughs> person, and he's <laughs> and he's lying. He's saying that fires are cultural, uh, that fires are natural in the rainforest, which is not true. The rainforest is not yeah, so an ecosystem for. I actually talk about that in the piece, not about them being natural, but about um, how like which is a really good piece by the oh, way. Oh, <laughs> thank you. About like the fact that indigenous people, when they set fires, they set them differently, yeah. and they allowed the land to regrow. And so, yeah, I agree with you. I was not at all implying that what was happening in the Amazon was like natural. Yeah, no, I'm sorry okay. to connect the two topics, but I'm actually agreeing with you. Okay. So. <laughs> uh, I don't mean to lecture, but uh, I'm more like taking advantage of this opportunity to uh, state what is happening in Brazil because it's so important. Whatever happens in the rainforest for the next, next, next two decades, decades uh, 
is going to uh, have implications for the whole world. Bolsonaro is the biggest threat for climate change right now. So <laughs> all that said, I'm sorry about that. I just want to ask you, uh, don't you think, as, an, as a journalist, I think we are spending too much energy and time discussing vocabulary. Like, it is a huge crisis. And we are like discussing about making it more, um, making it nicer for readers, you know? It's a crisis, we have to say what is happening. It's a huge problem. So don't you think that instead of speaking about that, we should be speaking about how to make it more personal, how to make our coverage more personal to people? I think they go Thank together, you. though. Um, I think, like, um, I guess that's what I was saying earlier, which is when I can't, when I, because I can't say climate crisis, because I can't use, I can't say inflammatory language um, as a knee jerk, um, I have to talk to people. I have to link it back to what's happening to people and what's happening to communities um, and let that tell the story as opposed to saying, like, we're all going to die. Um, <laughs> which we are, but, you know, ideally. <laughs> I, 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 think that's really, I think that's really interesting. I mean, this idea of climate crisis sort of denotes, you're, you're saying it is a crisis, but while it's a problem, some people, it's just true, may not see it as a crisis, right? Their perception of risk is very different potentially, right? They see as hunger for children in a, uh, you know, in, in X is the crisis. So I, I think, I just was curious how you think about that, right? Do you, do you call something a crisis because you, it's very important, but do you call that the crisis or something else? And do you go down a slippery slope when you start doing that? I don't know. I think um, the thing that I'm most concerned about um, is that some people think that they can opt out of the problem, that like, oh, it'll be a problem in Bangladesh. Or um, we got an email one time from someone in California um, who was like, I don't live on the coast, so why should I care about climate change? <laughs> um, and so that has, you know, I mean, I joked for a while that I had a no sea level rise, no coral reefs rule. Um, and I don't, it's not like a hard and fast rule, but. Um, I do think that because you're so visual and because it's just so easy to, you know, you can go to Louisiana and you can see that, you know, the areas that are flooding, you can go to um, Virginia and you can see the areas that are flooding, it becomes an easy crutch to use that as a narrative. Mm -hmm. And the risk, and that was why I brought up drought earlier, is the risk that we run into is that people who are going to be horrifically affected in really severe ways don't know it because um, unfortunately it's like not visual enough. I did. Um, I joke that I'm on the animal beat, but I did this story about um, how bears, uh, black bears, won't hibernate um, as it gets warmer. Um, and yeah, and so <laughs> the crutch of it, you're like, well, why do I care? Uh, <laughs> I'm not a bear. But like the problem, <laughs> <laughs> the problem is, is that if they don't hibernate, like bears, black bears are like just smart enough to be a problem. Um, and so if they don't hibernate, they do things like they break into people's homes and then you have to put them down or you hit them with your car and you die. This has happened. Um, so like, like if the longer they're awake, the more these kinds of incidents happen. And so like in the story, um, just because of a weird settlement in Nevada, there was this whole list of all of these like bear complaints that people put in. And so I put the complaints in the story and it was like some of it was like, you know, I went outside and there was a bear swimming in my pool. Like, that is scary. <laughs> I actually also work with Jenny at Living on Earth. So um, so something I think a lot about when I think of journalism and also very relevant environmental journalism is bias. And it's so hard to balance, you know, between, um, as we were talking before, advocacy versus being objective and also the different solutions and, like, how do you not... Um, like focus on one versus another. And as journalists, I'd love to hear your perspective on how you balance these different biases. I mean, both the New York Times and ProPublica have reputations for a certain mm -hmm. bias in the political spectrum. Is that something that you ever consider when you're <laughs> pitching a story? Or like how, like, what is that process in terms of recognizing that you're having uh, not just multiple sides of the story, but the right sides and putting significant weight to everything that might matter and ignoring the noise? I mean, I first, I don't think it's biased to say that the planet should be livable. Like, I'm yeah. guessing, <laughs> you know, if, if people say, because you write about climate change and you want, you know, 
the planet to be inhabitable by humans for a sustainable period of time, then that counts as bias, then I think that's a problem. Um, so, and also, you know, we, we go after the facts. So we are starting from the baseline that climate change is real. It's a serious problem. And, you know, we're not, you know, and then that is like the baseline assumption when you read any of our climate stories. I think the other thing that we take very seriously is we have a no surprises rule. So before publication, um, particularly with our longer investigations, we contact every person quoted and mentioned in the story and we do a fact check, right? It doesn't mean if they say something, doesn't mean we let them control what we say, but we make it very clear to them, we're gonna tell you how we quote you in the story or how we talk about you in the story and we're gonna check the facts. And if you can show us objectively that we've gotten something wrong, we'll fix it. Um, but if, you know, maybe you said something in a little more emphatic way than perhaps you would like, but it's still factually correct, we may not change it. So I think dealing with that helps make people understand how seriously we take it and, and our approach. And you know, I've talked to sources who may not be happy, but they appreciate that we do that fact checking um, you know, very rigorously. Um, and I've even done things like, I've had experiences where I've talk to the authors of a report and say, this is how we summarize your report in one sentence. And they might say something like, well, I don't think that's accurate. And then I'm saying, here is the exact line in your study that says what we're saying. <laughs> so I've had instances where I end up fact checking them and make them realize that's actually what their yeah. report is saying. Kendra's, because it's, 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 look, there's a, there's a, it's known as that the media has a liberal bias. So I don't think, it, 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 I'm just curious how, how you deal with that. Um, <clears throat> so I think that, um, in media in general, there's a really big discussion right now around what is bias and what is neutrality. And often neutrality has been through um, a white male affluent gaze, and there's been a lot of pushback against that, um, rightly, I think, because that they aren't the world. And um, <laughs> <laughs> what? Like, that, that is a fact, right? That like, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> uh, um, and there's a really good. Um, paper that's called um, The Weirdest People in the World, and the weird, I can't never remember what it stands for, it's like Western educated, about the bias inherent in a lot of psychological studies, because they're all mm -hmm. on Western, or on like, you know, us mainly. Um, so I don't operate from the, I operate from the perspective that we're all biased, um, and that um, I, you know, I've even tweeted out that I have a pro-Earth bias, I'm definitely biased in that regard. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, so that doesn't, I feel like where that bias, where anyone's bias comes up is in the stories that you choose to report on more than how you execute mm -hmm. those stories. Um, and so I'm constantly consumed with the stories that I'm not telling and um, the stories that I want to tell and figuring out how I can tell those stories um, is like what kind of consumes my time as opposed to whether or not someone is going to email me or call me a cunt, which has happened. Um, because they're going to do that anyway and I don't really care um, if the facts are right. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I'm just going to add that I think you should, you know, I probably should sometimes. Yeah. That on the radio, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think sometimes there may be a different, because climate change has become so politicized, right. there's sometimes a different standard applied to what people perceive as bias in right. climate journalists. So if you're an education journalist, it's pretty much taken for granted that it, your position is children should have a good education in their school and have adequate resources and like not be abused by the staff or the teachers. And having that as your baseline assumption does not make you biased. You know, in the same way that business reporters have the baseline assumption when the economy grows, it's good. No business reporter probably is going around saying, let's have a recession, we need a recession. Like, if, if we can accept those basic truths as not being biased in those other beats, then I don't see why like Kendra said, being pro-Earth should be considered a bias. And I've, I mean, I've tweeted this before, so I'm, I'm, and someone's probably quoted me on this, but like what she was saying about business reporter, one of my perpetual frustrations mm -hmm. is when you're watching the debates, and there's some TV reporter interviewing um, a candidate that is talking about their economic platform. The person interviewing them is a millionaire. Um, that is a bias. They do not have the same economic interests as the vast majority of Americans, but that is somehow fine. 
that is unremarked upon. We've, we've accepted that as normal. Hmm. Um, but if you're a woman or if you're a person of color, there's implicit in a lot of journalism this viewpoint that you're biased. Somehow that is, that is bias. Um, so I think, yeah, so that's why I hate that question and why I think bias is, I think we're all biased. I, I had one question already, so feel free to just skip it or give a very short answer. But I would be interested in like your your mode of of having impact as as journalists. Like I, you said before that um, you you like your your work to be read by by like politicians or people who have power to change something, and I guess you also have some sort of power to like move people on the spectrum from I want you to panic to like feel good solution stories maybe or. I guess you have a lot of different ways to to have impact on people, and I would be interested in like uh, how that how those work. You mean as they approach stories, are they thinking about what kind of impact they want on the people or the the end result? Uh, I'm thinking more the end result. Like like you you said you were pro Earth, right? And and so probably there's some hope that through your work, your journalism, you you might move the needle a bit. And and I was wondering like through through what means, through what does this happen? Sure. I mean, I think it's. It can be particularly difficult to move the needle on climate change because it's become so politicized, and you know, it's it's so difficult to talk about for for many people. And and I think that um, you know, I I think perhaps what has actually happened in the past couple of years is does give me optimism because the public's urgency about climate change has gone up exponentially. The public's anger in some ways in, in recognizing that there's no getting away from reducing fossil fuel usage and reducing the actual production of fossil fuels. And that this one message that activists have spent years trying to get out, the idea of leave it in the ground, there's a lot of fossil fuel reserves we simply cannot afford to dig up and burn if we are to keep the planet at a reasonable temperature. That has gotten into the public conscious in a, in a much bigger way, and there is a lot more attempts to hold fossil fuel companies accountable through, through various lawsuits. You know, ExxonMobil was just on trial in New York a few weeks ago. Um, and, and through the idea that, you know, yes, there are things we can do as individuals to help with the climate solution, but ultimately we, we are gonna need huge systemic changes to solve this in a reasonable way, and doing that we're not going to get there just by recycling your lunch tofu container or something. Right. Um, I think for me, I think a lot about the notion of informed consent. Um, and so we are making a decision as a society, as a planet, about the future of this planet. But many of us are doing it very passively. And so for me, it's making sure that whatever direction we go in, so let's say we go through to the worst case scenario, that people are almost making, that we're making a clear-eyed decision that we, we do want to jump off this cliff, um, as opposed to it being something that is happening to us. What are your impressions about the fossil fuel industry companies and the automobile industry and so on uh, toward this problem? Uh, I'm sure you encounter them in your reporting. And I'd be curious to hear what, um, what your impressions are about where they stand regarding the issue, solutions, their responsibility, so on. I mean, I think in the past few years, there's been a lot of um, both reporting and academic research that has unearthed how long fossil fuel and, and, and utilities and some car companies have understood that their main products are contributing to climate change. Uh, you know, I was part of the team at Inside Climate that wrote those stories about Exxon's history in, in really good climate research um, and how that was very different from their later move into funding disinformation campaigns. There's been a lot of academics digging through archives, finding oil company involvement in, in climate-related research as far back as the 60s. Um, and so I think this is you know, the, the, the history of what they knew is becoming clearer and clearer. And now there is, I think, increasing accountability from the public to try to get them to change their core business model. Um, and there was a really good story, actually, in the New York Times by, by your colleague about, um, I think she attended some conference where fossil fuel executives were saying, 
Look at how much mm -hmm. money we spent the past year on various clean energy initiatives. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the, the reporter did the calculations and did the math and said, but even the most you know, even the company spending the most, that was only a few percent of their overall overall spending. Right. So you can see that despite the big numbers being thrown around, it's it's a marginal priority for them compared to their continued work in getting new oil and gas. Right. Um, and so I, I think that those kinds of, the, the truth about what, what they're doing and the extent of their investment in various fossil fuel alternatives is getting more and more attention and people are paying more attention and, and trying to hold them accountable in, in increasing ways. Yeah. Um, but a question um, for both of you, um, Lisa and Kendra, about kind of work and process. Um, Lisa, you have an incredible luxury of having months or a year or possibly more to work on a single story. And I'm wondering how do you keep momentum? How do you keep yourself going um, with such a long deadline? Uh, and then I'll ask them both, and then I'll let you both respond. And then, Kendra, for you, um, as you're writing so many stories, how do you carve out time to do bigger stories, more enterprise stories? Um, how do you work to get that in? How do you find the time to do that? Um, I guess for momentum, it's, you know, I talk a lot with my editor. It helps to have someone to talk to, whether it's a colleague you're working with or an editor, to just keep checking in and make sure Am I going in the right direction? Am I finding enough new things that this is starting to feel like a real story? Um, checking in to make sure I'm not diving into some weird rabbit hole that's useless and going to waste my time. Um, because the whole point of having a lot of time to work on a story is you want to make sure you're spending your time efficiently so that the final product is worth it. And so, you know, do a lot of check ins. I try to write summaries for myself sometimes during the reporting process or, or memos and outlines and just anything I can to make sure the shape of the story is turning out in a way that seems worth it. Um, and, and oftentimes, you know, because it's an investigation, you're driven by the idea that this is really important info and the public needs to know it. And that in itself is often just a great motivator. Um, for me, I, I kind of feel like I'm a chaos monkey. Um, so I would love to say that, like, oh, I carve out an hour every day um, to work on my longer form things. I do not. So I basically wait for there to stop being fires or a lull in, like, um, scientific research. And then I, like, hide and scroll away on the thing that I've been working on for a longer period of time. And then something inevitably pops up, and I have to shove it in a dark corner. Um, and then a week or two goes by, and I go back to it. Um, or longer. Um, I am doing a story now that I started in January, and um, like I'm finally writing it. And I knew I interviewed someone, and I could not find the file um, because I also switched computers halfway, um, <laughs> because of, and phones, um, because of course you do. And I was like, I know I interviewed him, and I was like, maybe, maybe I talked to him on the phone. And because my computer is enough of a mess, I didn't delete the folder that contains all of the files from my old phone. Um, even though it's a duplicate file, um, and it was in there. And I found it because um, I found the email where we agreed to have the interview, and then I sorted the audio files by D. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't have a really good answer for you. <laughs> but you do it. You get it done. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we're supposed to be done at 8, and it is, like, exactly 8. So I just want to give a round of applause for, for Lisa and Kendra. Really amazing. Amazing.